Starkey the Not Minion. Did I give you permission to move house? Uh, well, the Afghanistan COVID relief bill paid for this, Majesty, and if you don't like it, you can always go back home. No, 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 no. That's exactly what they'll be expecting. Who is they? <laughs> Mistress, I have a review for you. You don't look happy about it. Yeah, I think you'll like this one. Well, that just sounds like a challenge. What is it? It's Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Oh, challenge accepted. Dead on arrival from the likes of the Killer Clowns. This is one of the outright classics of late 80s genre goofballery. Its premise is very, very simple. There are clowns from outer space, and they kill. Spoilers. It does what it says in the tin, and few films do it more. This was written and directed by the Chiodo Brothers, a trio of special effects artists who specialize in puppets and stop motion. You might have seen their work in Team America, The Simpsons, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Screamers, or Turbo, a Power Rangers sequel. This film exists for two primary reasons, to showcase that work and to entertain the fuck out of you and it's really good at both. We start, as often happens, with the credits, and it's already clear we're in for a treat. Not only do most of the cast sound like they were created by Stan Lee, but the theme song is the best song Oingo Boingo never made. The rest of the score is by John Mazzari, who only mentioned because he also did the score to Jesus VR, a VR Jesus biopic that actually exists and I'm currently wondering how the fuck I can review it. But back to the cast for a moment, we have Royal Dano, which is what happens when you cross Paul Dano with the plot of King Ralph. And playing Officer Mooney is noted character actor John Vernon, who I'm pretty sure is just pissed off that he's in the film at all. I think he's ad living the fuck out of his part, and they're all too scared to stop him, so they just have to work around it. One of his first acts in the film is to stare, full of loathing at Goodwill. Start as he mean to go on. Oh sweet, beer brand beer, East Germany's favourite beer. Little known fact, but in the 80s, the definition of teenager was briefly stretched to 28 in certain parts of the USA, therefore explaining most of the main characters, who were all hanging out in the communal boinking area. I'm Jojo the ice cream clown with the bestest ice cream in town. We'll give you the stick, you give it a lick. The age before internet porn was a tragic wasteland of ice cream based single entendres. And it'll tickle you all the way down. Cool off those hot lips with our tasty frozen fruity bars and everyone's favorite frozen delight, the liquor stick. The invention of dogging delayed, it's time for us to meet our smoking hard leads. Mike Tobacco, noted Crawford Tillinghast impersonator, and his girlfriend, Debbie Stone. So far, the most interesting thing about them is they got badly lost when they tried to buy an air mattress. I would much rather be kissing you. And there's also the Terenzi brothers, owners of Chekhov's ice cream van. That's the guy they rent it from. And the walking slash driving comic relief in a film that's about 80% constructed from the staff. Why don't we just park here for a while? Hey, what are you guys trying to pull here? You, clearly. What kind of girls do you think we are? The kind of girls who will get into a van with two strange guys on the promise of free ice cream. Anyway, the Terenzis conclude that the reason they're not getting laid isn't to do with them, or that the girls don't want to, but the location. So they decide to go try some even less romantic. Why don't we try the drive-in? Oh, that's dumb. Hey, wait a minute. What's playing? What's playing? With them gone, it allows Stanley and Phyllis for an obvious clown victim and Claire and Andre no lines to spend the rest of their short, off-screen lives together in peace. Overall, it's been a pretty good night for everyone. Well, except for this guy who's doing a crash test dummy and hasn't worked it out yet. This is great. Yeah. 
Yeah, it'd be a pity if it got ruined by some killer clowns. From outer space? What? In a movie? Of the same title? What's the chances of that happening? Fast approaching 100%, Captain. That was incredible! Holy shit, you must never see animation in the wild anymore! The comet, which is actually the clown spaceship coming into land, but you don't know that yet, is also seen by this dude who's gonna die shortly. I know this because incoherent rednecks, who are the first person to find space shit, always die shortly after. And he's landed in our backyard! We're gonna be rich! Who are we gonna be rich? Moonshine explains basically everything about this guy. Up to and including him walking like he badly needs a dump. Why he suddenly starts walking normally between shots. And why he apparently forgot that he owns the land. What in blue blazes the circus doing up in these parts? And he's landed in our backyard! What in blue blazes the circus doing up in these parts? Squatting, apparently. Nah, this is the killer clown's shit because branding is very important. Anyway, movie, killing this dude, hell, killing an entire town of Americans is all very well and good and laudable, but I have to draw the line at hurting dogs. <laughs> Pooh Bear? Not cool. Where's my Pooh Bear? I'll tear this thing apart with my bare hand! But how? They kidnapped him. I gotta say, it is kind of brave of this dude to name his dog Pooh Bear, as he seems to be the sort of guy who'd occasionally get confused with what species his dog is, even if he called him Dog. Maybe he thinks it really is a bear. Hmm. You might be onto something there. <laughs> Okay, I feel personally attacked by the design of that clown. Features on, uh... Torture. <laughs> Debbie and Mike also saw where the comet landed, and she'd rather go look for it than find out if it really is the size of the boat or the motion of the ocean. Come on, you can find it. Mike knows he's a disappointing lover, so only cries on the inside. Okay. Meanwhile, across town in the 3rd by 3rd by 3rd precinct building, John Vernon's acting like a cross between the Punisher and a stripper. And it's scum like you that are killing this town. <laughs> the Easter guy's terrible crime was walking through the park with some alcohol, and it appears that Officer Vernon might have picked on them because of homophobia. But the weird thing is, I can't tell if the makers intended that or not. I'll explain, he accuses them of boozing in the park. I got him boozing it up in the park. They said they were walking back to their dorms at the college with a bottle of wine and went through the park because it was a beautiful night. We were just walking through the park on the way to the dorm. We had a bottle of wine. Yeah, it's a beautiful night. We were walking around. We didn't do nothing. Okay, none of this means gay, but the guy in black and white seems to be wearing makeup and he has hearts in his shirt. But it's the 80s and it's an I Love New York shirt. That little moment straddles the line between obvious and subtle so deeply that ironically it could have been targeted by an anti-sodomy law. Hell, maybe Officer Vernon saw them and made homophobic assumptions, but the guys aren't a couple. Or maybe they are and Officer Vernon didn't realize and it was just being a plain old non-homophobic dick. It's all so ambiguous. Hopefully, Officer Unusually Twinkie Martin Short lookalike will be able to help us get to the bottom of the mystery. You guys go to the college, right? Yeah, yeah, right. So why don't you just stay there and do your drinking on campus? I mean, we don't have to just stay on campus. Yeah, we're gonna be 40 in a few years. And it's scum like you that are killing this town. Even that sounds fairly cut and dry, but this is a small town and some straight college kids dressing weird would get much the same reaction from local assholes. And none of this is helped by the fact that we could have a scene with these two guys 69ing and Officer Blondie would still look more like a gay stereotype than anyone else in a 10 mile radius. You got a thing for these little boys? No. In most films, I just assume this is homophobia and it was all intended, but this is killer clowns from outer space. Anything subtler than a foghorn in a light show might as well not exist. Anyway, they're jailed. Enough about Schrodinger's homophobia, because Mike and Debbie have just about tracked down that circus tent. At least partially, I assume, because of Mike's superior perching ability. If instinct serve chief correct, uh -huh. path lie that way. Typical Americans. Can't track anything without racism. Circus tent? What's a circus tent doing all the way out here? Standing. Causing light pollution. 
featuring in a movie. I assume because no one who gave a fuck preferred the script. It's not Mike, not Deb, who's obsessed with investigating shit. Come on, this looks neat. Let's check this out. No, let's go. I've seen enough. Oh, come on, Deb. Of course, because the film's title, investigating circus-related shit once more wins over fucking. Okay, so there's a door there now. So either the clowns just put that there, or the old guy in the earlier scene only walked a little bit around the tent before assuming that there wasn't one. How are we supposed to get in and see the show? My theory is the ship operates on toon rules like in Roger Rabbit, and having a door there just wasn't funny before. Deb, you are gonna love this. Don't be a baby. Check this out, it's a set! No more location shooting for us! The 80s were a magical time when characters could truly believe that a chemical plant, as reimagined by Willy Wonka, was actually inside a tent. And we all just kind of went along with that. I blame the cocaine. What kind of circus is this? This is that, that new wave European circus fantastique. Mike, keep it down. Somebody will catch us. Guys, this place is great or what? Standing in one place and yelling loudly about how awesome the place you're trespassing in is some next level trespassing. I half expect him to try and break into a military base so we can upload a photo of them trespassing to ARPANET. This is no fun house. It's a space station. No, it's Unicron. No, it's the latest thing from that European circus fantastique. A fun silo. <laughs> Is it a nuclear power plant? No, to camp. A military base. Touché. And it would save you some time for your upload. I like how her performance is just too dramatic to waste in a matte painting. The shooting star! What are you talking about? The shooting star we went to go look for! We are in it! It's either that or you've stumbled into a replica of the TOS Enterprise that's constructed by a dedicated though colorblind fan. Anyway, they hear some shadows. What, what was that? So decide to hide in the testicle room. Look at this place. It's a little bit staid compared to the rest, isn't it? You know, I don't know what we saw out there before, but uh, <laughs> this looks like a cotton candy factory to me. Mike is the dunningest Kruger who ever lived, and performance-wise, he's like Joey Tribbiani playing Jeffrey Combs. It's very odd. Good thing Debbie has a higher IQ than the set decoration. This must be where they're hanging up to dry before they ship the stuff out. No, it's not! I've seen how they make cotton candy, you fucking idiot. Haven't you ever been to a fair? No. I don't believe in UFOs. Debbie, please. It's not flying, so it can't be a UFO. But if they do exist, then then we're trapped in one right now. Because the only thing more powerful than his idiocy is his self-belief, Mike still thinks that it's candy floss. What? Luckily, a dejected-looking clown arrives in corpse duty, so they need to escape before Mike can assume that these dudes are giant gummy bears. They try to sneak out, unfortunately they manage to run across the giant floor synthesizer as they go. But, seeing as it was the 80s, they just made it part of the score. Naturally unhappy that some random humans would wander into the ship through the open door that they just put there, the clown sends some of their most insidious weaponry after them homing popcorn, and a balloon dog trained to sniff out said homing popcorn. Dog. 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 Dog, dog. Dog, 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 dog. Okay. Like I told the clowns, I do not give a fuck if you kill each other, and in fact, I can get behind it in most cases, but STOP KILLING DOGS! Hey, I think I'm still alive. That can't be right. Hey, am I still alive? Is it really living without your dog? Anyway, the clowns start walking into town, of course, at that speed it'll take them the whole fucking film, and most of the yet unmade sequel to arrive. It is damn fine walking music, though. Anyway, Debbie has a friend in the local police station and is sure they can convince him about what's going on. I don't know, Debbie. I wouldn't even believe us. Yeah, but you're usually wrong about stuff. Anyway, our friend, please be John Vernon, please be John Vernon, please be John Vernon. You gotta help us! We gotta do something! There are two people dead! 
dead! Who, Debbie? Who's dead? Oh, God damn it! Though to be fair, it couldn't really be Officer Vernon, and that man is incapable of friendship. So they explain exactly what's going on, carefully taking their time to send as crazy as possible. Cocoons! Cocoons. Yes, cocoons! You know, cocoons! You know, the film! Directed by Ron Howard! Exactly why that bit of what happened had to be iterated and reiterated as an unsolved mystery, mainly because no one gives enough of a fuck to ask the writers about it. I love the younger cop guy's approach to acting. He knows he can't be more of the top than everything else, so he's decided to do the opposite. Alright, sit down. Let's start from the beginning, all right? It's like acting by the fundamentals of judo. But instead of finding the shooting star, we saw this, this circus tent. Hmm, what's all this youth going on? It makes me sick. Killer clowns from outer space. Sounds like the perfect movie for you brain-dead, insolent little twerps. It's hard to get across in the review, but behind all the zany clown action and related shenanigans, there's a barely perceptible cop drama about idealism versus cynicism and experience versus naivete bubbling just under the surface, giving these two scenes a slightly weird structure. Anyway, Officer Vernon, otherwise known as what would happen if you gave Chet from Weird Science a dour Logany spin-off, has recognized Mike as one of the Transy brothers' friends, giving him a new and exciting reason to hate the guy. You hang out with the Terenzi brothers? Clown. I get it. Another one of their stupid stunts to sell ice cream from that goddamn truck those hoodlums run around in. Dude, there are many words you can use to describe people in ice cream vans, small business owners, honest family types, possible sex offenders, lovable scamps, or serial killers in an episode of Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, to name but a few, but not hoodlums. That's just a Venn diagram that shouldn't exist. Clowns. I get it. Besides, do you know what's clown themed in this town? Everything. Everything. EVERYTHING! This is the fucking Salem of Circus Ray. This is like a cop in Maryland assuming a guy's trouble because his friend owns a crab shack. Anyway, as he's low-key in love with Debbie, Officer Martin Short decides to go check out the circus tent with them. Go ahead, Dave. Make a dummy out of yourself. But you're not gonna make a dummy out of me. Foreshadowing! Foreshadowing! Sh Oh, oh, right, right, right. Thank you. So the clowns have arrived in town. I'm guessing the theme music picked up pace while they're off screen. Actually, that's pretty good. It sounds like Gabber played on power lines. They're getting up to all kinds of hijinks from a killer space based Punch and Judy show. Hmm. Punch and E.T. E.T. Hit husband with bat. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, clown. Anyone who finds that funny needs to be called. And away from that to some looting in a camasts. The <laughs> catter clowns from outer space. And even worse, liberal use of the eggplant emoji. Outside the chemist, Tracy from the original 70s Ghostbusters is trying to eke out a living. It's not glamorous, but busking makes him feel good. Elsewhere, white America destroys stereotypes by opening its doors to these things at night without firearms. I mean, look at the proportions of the clown's faces in the outfits. It's like someone on a bad trip were menaced by a gang of Rondo Hattons as drag queens, and the film's a very expensive attempt at therapy. At least the Marilyn Manson art is appropriately confused. Officer Martin Short decides that the film's not quite sexist enough, so takes a detour, forcing Deb to go home so he can take Mike to the tent alone. He's probably gonna take me up on top of the hill and shoot me. Only if they forget which cop they're scripting. Anyway, what do you know? The tent is suddenly missing. It was right there where that hole is. That hole which wasn't there before and is mysteriously roughly the size of a circus tent. You see, Martin is Debbie's ex and he's jealous. It doesn't change the way I feel about you, little Debbie. So before you can say all cops in this town are bastards, Mike's been arrested for wasting police time. Mooney was right, huh? Got nothing better to do but cause problems. And across in the unusually tame graffiti district, we're back with the murderous clown shenanigans. <laughs> Big bad Jojo coming into town. <laughs> oh no, Jojo's not gonna stand for that. Star Platinum. <laughs> I'm sorry. I seem to have broken your bite. 
You know, mocking a clown seems to be a bit of a futile endeavor. It's a bit like doing weird shit to a rabbit to antagonize a magician, or screaming incoherently at a YouTuber. No matter how much you do it, they're already the expert. What are you gonna do? Knock my block off? <laughs> Typical, everyone's a big man until the heads start coming off. <laughs> anyway, this kid's not enjoying what technically counts as a meal at... <sighs> big Top Burger. Luckily, the nightmare she ordered has finally arrived to save her. Good thing waving makes you invisible to most people. I really can't blame her for going, that seat looks really uncomfortable. No going out alone at night with that strange looking man until you're fat enough that he won't want to rape you, young lady. The stuff with the chemist is actually a recurring bit. They keep cutting back to the clowns fucking around with stuff while this guy stands impotently off to the side, safe in his own shot. I assume the actor was filmed separately, but then he was finally noticed by the clowns and gets killed, so clearly I was right. He was being kept safe by being in a different shot. The same one they reuse several times. For reasons of making the plot go quicker, Officer Short Cop stops at the fuck spot on the way back into town and finds Elton John's tribute act that episode of the X-Files with the bright green insect thanks. Is there any way I can get off my fingers quickly without betraying my cool exterior? Check this out. Where'd you get that? Over that Jeep over there. That's McReed's Jeep. Who's McReed? Bob McReed? He was up here tonight with me and Debbie. He was quietly masturbating in one of the other cars. And anyway, I plot moved on, so now he's a believer. Unlike Officer John Vernon, who believes only in doing the violent parts of his job, and standing by the awards he got for doing the violent parts of his job. <laughs> <laughs> Guns are hilarious. And just how dedicated is he to being angry and unreasonable? Well, enough to abuse the suburbanites calling in about the clowns. Well, you don't need a police pal, you need a psychiatrist. Rich little bastards. I'd shoot them all. Well, it makes a difference from shooting poor people. Honestly, it's much easier to list groups he doesn't hate. Everyone who's him. He's also unreasonable enough to assume that the dozens of calls he gets about the murder clowns are part of a townwide conspiracy aimed at the impossible task of making him look worse than he already is. Could the Renzi brothers have the whole town in on this? What the hell with them all? They want to play games? They're messing with the wrong guy. I am the law. And the law is an ass. <laughs> Jesus! Only if you squint. The fast and the funniest. <laughs> over at the burger joint, the clown never quite got over being denied the little girl of his choice. So he plants some popcorn in their fancy personalized bin and waits for it to bloom into murder. Hey, what's that sound? Is it Gizmo from Gremlins? It is, it is Gizmo from Gremlins! I am a really big fan! Wait, does this technically count as feeding after midnight? Anyway, from Big Top Burger to Big Top Shower. Debbie couldn't put it off any longer, it's the 80s and she needed to get naked. You see, all that homing popcorn will allow the clowns to track her down as soon as it's convenient. It's important that she's silenced eventually because she knows their secret and could blow their cover. Their cover, which is apparently that they're a gang of non-alien magical murder clowns. This whole town is a meaner case of cholerophilia than a festival's worth of horny juggalos. The Shadow Puppet! The Shadow Puppet? The Shadow Puppet! There he is, I told you. You get out there and shoot him? Kill him! Just hang on, calm down. Let me check this out. <laughs> Holy shit! Typical, the one time an American cop shows fucking restraint. Oh, They've Mike, run him Mike, down! Mike! Mike! <laughs> He's gone. He went straight up. 
And he's been gone long enough that if he comes down again, we might be in trouble. Anyway, time to call for some deeply antagonistic backup. The legendarily pissed off John Vernon. Mooney, I want you to listen to me and don't say anything. Start off with your most extreme demand, I see. Okay, Dave, that's it. Screw you and your college flunkies. I've had enough of this from you and from everyone else. If you so much as show your face again here, you little maggot, I'm gonna arrest you an aggravated suspicion of pissing me off. Well, it's gonna take a hell of a lot more than a lame prank like this to get Curtis Mooney to throw in his badge, so fuck you! It'd make a crack about his descent into paranoia, but the film is full of things that are out to get him. They've just not dropped into the police station yet. Hilariously, the film's a little unclear about which of these two guys is higher rank. I think they're meant to be the same, but I like to think Martin Short's in charge, and Vernon really has no more fox left. Anyway, Mike and Officer Martin decide to split up. Martin's going to the station, and Mike's gonna help the Terenzi brothers catch the rogue ice cream van. The truck's getting away! And don't do anything stupid. You mean, apart from everything I just said, right? Besides, you do realise what film you're in, you're kind of limiting his options. It doesn't really come across in tiny review clips, but Mike and Officer Blondie have almost instantly become best friends. In most films, this staccato approach to character development would be a problem, but in this it means more time for shenanigans, so I'm not complaining. The rest of the mission is to drive around the town, warning everyone about the clowns that are loudly and unsubtly killing everyone. Something horrible's happened, I need your help. Well, what are you talking about? What's wrong? There's no time to explain. So allow me to waste some time explaining. There's clowns going around killing people. Huh. And then even more time explaining in depth. Look, tonight Debbie and I were up, were up on the top of the world. And we found a spaceship and there's these, there these clouds and there was carrying these, these cotton candy cocoons. And there's these, these, these popcorn guns. And there's, there's, there's a circus spaceship, right? Right, it's quite damn, but we were there, we saw the whole thing. I love it when someone starts a conversation with there's no time to explain. And the other people have to tell them to get to the fucking point. Hey Mike, what do you want us to do? We have ice cream to sell tonight. It just shows such disrespect to the cliche. Hey Mike, what do you want us to do? We have ice cream to sell tonight. Well, here's an idea. Sell it tomorrow when hopefully there'll be less murder to compete with for attention. Well, we haven't sold that much ice cream tonight. We haven't sold any. Is this even summer? Anyway, Mike convinces them to help out by appealing to their better nature. He tells them that Debbie has two big titted roommates who love ice cream. She's got two beautiful roommates with big boobs. Do they like ice cream? I say better nature because her baseline isn't exactly great. I made it through Korea, I can make it through this bullshit. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and sometimes it's a dick sticking symbolically out of a guy's head. Anyway, one of the clowns got bored with waiting for Officer Vernon to leave the station. Honestly, I think what half the calls he's been ignoring have been the clowns trying to... Send more paramedics. Him. Well, son, I think you made a big mistake. You're in Mooney's territory now. Is he threatening him with a group wedding? Oh no wait, sorry, Mooney's the character's actual name. Alright. I'm supposed to read you your rights. But you're in Mooney's jail. The Mooney bin, you might say. And you ain't got no rights. And all you got are wrongs. The trolling continues as the clown gives him a hand by seeing himself to the sails. Hey, Officer Mooney, come on, let us out of here. Yeah, are we gonna be here all night or what? Yeah, we get one phone call, don't we? Well. Those guys have been in there for so long, they forgot that Mooney's only ridiculously over the top and horrifically ugly on the inside. Get in there. <clears throat> Pretty sure you can buy that a bad dragon. It's called the ACAB. All clowns are bonerific. What are you in for? Clowning around. Duh. Elsewhere, Debbie is somehow still showering, but that's not important right now because the film's had a change of heart and decided to try and be a horror movie. It's got ominous dark corridors, eerie silence, building tension, technicolor egg morphing, <laughs> that really long dick, a dramatic slow turn, and best of all, law enforcement is a literal puppet of a murderous amoral clown. Plus ça change. Don't worry, Dave. All we want to do is kill you. Oh, how prescient. But their heart gets changed back almost instantly when Martin Short realizes that, like most clowns, they can be killed if they get shot in the face. <laughs> I've not killed enough clowns to confirm if most also turn into disco balls, though. <laughs> 
back with a trend season tobacco, which sounds like a quirky Italian Cajun fusion restaurant. They're as speeding around as is possible in that van, yelling about the clowns 20X was about. I think I've worked out where they never sell any ice cream. They never stop. Hell, they never even slow down. So any extras that they do pass will hear a couple of words of the message and have to wait until they do another lap to hear the rest. Anyway, the brothers still aren't convinced. Ooh, I mean, what do you think we are? Yeah, we're not as stupid as we look. You are precisely as stupid as you look. If there are killer clowns running around here, then I'm Porky Pig. Your real life animation is stunning, Mr. Pig. <laughs> I'm really not sure if it was worth traveling all this way for a moderately sized collection of Ron Jeremy Dick tributes though. Anyway, Debbie's finally finished in the shower. I think the camera guy sent to film her topless scene got turned into a cocoon, and she eventually gave him a wedding forearm. <coughs> Holy crap, it's like HR Giga got depressed and went to the great Count Pagliacci and thought his act was shit. They look like something from a trauma movie. Killer condom in particular. The homing popcorn turned into these things that I assume are baby clowns. We come for your daughter, Chuck. Cleverly, she escapes when she remembers that outside of porn, clowns have no gag reflex. <laughs> and it's very decent of her to help keep these two dry when the other inevitably explodes off screen. Debbie, Debbie, it's Mike, open up! Mike? I'm really not sure why the clowns are so interested in her that they feel the need to send a whole commando squad after her. I mean, there's the obvious thing that they need a damsel in distress so the other leads can be heroic. And obviously, letting a woman be a hero would be far too weird for a film where someone gets trapped inside the alien from Dark Star. Shit, what is that? A film that's going all out and making her indistinguishable from a fucking object. Okay, I'll try to be fair. The clowns have clearly been capturing random people because they realize that some of them have to be the main characters and they just got lucky with her. Come on, we can't lose them, they got Debbie! Here's a point. Whoever heard of a film called Two Schmucks and a Jeffrey Combs clone does Dallas. Because these idiots and Officer Martin Short are apparently the only humans left alive in town, either that or they wisely spent all the money earmarked for extras in the finale, either way, they team up and head for the amusement park. Oh, so that's where the coastline was. I thought the clowns stole it. You see, the clowns moved the tent to the amusement park after Mike and Debbie's visit. Now, you might think them landing in the woods initially was bad aiming on their part, but for all we know, their ship was launched out of a large cannon back on their home planet, and it was almost a perfect shot. Finally, we can see why John Vernon was so angry. He couldn't grow a moustache as fine as that. And it took over an hour, but we finally have a clown car joke. A pretty bad one. It should have been a single take with many more clowns. The park's closed. I'll have to ask you to leave. Well, we're gonna have to ask you to die. Pie. Sorry, pie. <laughs> the invention of splashing was fairly inglorious, but it eventually took off and it stopped melting people. <laughs> Look at this stuff. Looks like a wad of melted ice cream. Very melted ice cream, seeing as it's steaming. Ooh, Elmer McCurdy flavor. Anyway, on to the ship. Ooh, scary. Shut up, you're gonna get us kicked off the movie. They head past the Hall of Godzilla Rejects, the Fog Monster Detention Center. Good thing too, he's a bit of a serial killer. The adjourning shrine to Tim Burton. And finally, the ceremonial wall nipple. Naturally, one of the Trenzy brothers. I don't know which one, I don't really care. The Terenzi brothers are Peruvian twins, literally as far removed from Siamese twins as you can get. Anyway, one of the Terenzi brothers can't help himself. <laughs> well, I don't know about the wall, but Fog Monster's turned on. Look, don't touch anything, okay? This place is probably booby-trapped. And you two are first-class fucking boobies! Hey, right, now look, you guys. Stay together. I don't have to run around and find you two. No problem. We can handle it. Oh! Now, where'd they go? Dash con, obviously. Hey, look, don't worry about the Trenzi brothers. Well, I kind of want them dead, too. They do this all the time. What? Go missing in alien spaceships? Well, it's nice to finally have a reason for why out of the whole town he chose them to help out against the clowns. So, in a spectacular bit of irony, the wannabe sex pest Terenzis end up with the only two female clowns in the film. And they like the taste of an ice cream man's cone. 
But say, take a shot. But I got a much better drinking joke coming up shortly. Anyway, Mike and Martin Short continue with a search. Wait a second. I recognize this place. It's got something to do with Crazy Quilt. No, it's somehow dumber than that. This is the tent that Debbie and I were in. Come on! Which means they went into this building without knowing it was a spaceship and weren't convinced by the earlier rooms. So they find their way into the storage room. Oh, this is incredible. The largest collection of scrotums in the known universe. Outside of one of Joe Exotic's lockboxes. Looks like they got the whole town. Real estate is about to get really cheap. One of the clowns arrives to take a sneaky drink from one of the pods. You see, the cocoons will liquefy the people inside, and like some humans, the clowns really like to drink red cola. <sighs> Tastes like Americans. With the clown gone, they figure that now's the time to realize that Debbie's clearly visible in her balloon slash novelty fish tank and go rescue her. The only way Americans know how. Uh, are you all right? oh. Naturally, ignoring all the people trapped in the other balloons. You see, on the one hand, releasing a bunch of people would cause trouble for the clowns and increase their chance of escaping. But on the other hand, actors' wages could be spent on special effects. Six of one, half a dozen of the effects shots. I have a question, clowns. Why don't you wear bulletproof nose guards that are even bigger and redder than your nose is? They're in no position to answer, though. They're far too busy being shot in the nose. I kind of skipped over it, but when Debbie's rescued, she hugged Officer Martin and not Mike. It looks like she's maybe thinking about giving up smoking, but no! This is more of that staccato character development. They seem to be poly now. Anyway, after a quick jaunt through the Tim Burton themed anglerfish, they make it to this corridor, which I fucking love. It's been designed to make you think you're running slightly faster than you are, which is just great for everyone's self-esteem. So they're trapped, clowns on one side, a series of ever smaller doors on the other, and only two useless people and a crack shot with a shotgun and more shots and approaching clowns in the middle. Another door! Honestly, I think you might get through slightly quicker if you just took the door thing as red at this point. Anyway, they get through the doors and find themselves trapped in another set designer's nightmare. But, you know, in a good way. Look at this place! Where do we go now? I don't know, maybe you should ask the Celestial Toy Maker. The finale, as finale arrived, the clowns approaching from behind the safe of the bell intro and the giant PlayStation move. Humans! Come out and play, yay! They'd be in trouble if they didn't know some man with a plan involving a van with a stand. I am the great and powerful Jojo! I have returned from my latest bizarre adventure in the form of the mighty ice cream van. Fear me! What I love about this is that I can think of two logical reasons for it, and they're both amazing. Either these two escaped from the clown woman, ran off, found their van, and just drove through every wall they could find until they found this room by accident. Or they took two for the team and had sex with the clown woman in exchange for access to the ship's comms or whatever, used them to find the others, and then drove right here. The clown's reactions are great. Either they're floored by the... Sheer fucking hubris. Or this is the second coming for them. Unfortunately, there's also a third coming, which, as expected, leads to an epic battle between the ice cream van and Clown and the Barbarian. <laughs> it's not that impressive. I can see the wires. I don't want to play here anymore. Can we go home now? Well, the Transy brothers died as they lived. Not at all. Anyway, Martin Short decides that now's the time for the heroic sacrifice. No! Jay, don't! We can all make it! Listen, Debbie, if we all make it, then the audience will think a trio's in our future, and America's just not ready for consensual polyamory in a sci-fi horror comedy franchise. Come on, guys, move! Run for help! Weird, the only nose he misses is the size of his head. Anyway, the rest of the cops have finally remembered that they exist, just in time to the ship take off and, more importantly, turn into master control from Tron. Inside, Martin Short is able to stab Clown and the Barbarian with the power of symbolism. 
to nobody everyone else, but Matt Stone looks really impressed. Anyway, Martin Short survived by hiding in the clown car. <laughs> Don't know what that thing was made of, but maybe they should try building the ship out of it next time. <laughs> Dave! Dave! Oh! Oh! You made it! Our love life just became one third more interesting! And the Transy survived. They were safely ensconced in their freezer when their van went up. Because multiple explosions and impact damage is nothing compared to the power of ice cream. They'd make bulletproof vests out of it, but there's not many gunshots in the Antarctic. Now, this might seem a little bit at a left field, and it kind of is. The original ending had the brothers and Martin Short dying on the ship, but it was decided that it was too depressing, so they filmed three alternate endings. This one where they all survived, one where Martin Short survived, and one where the Transy brothers survived. I can understand why they thought the original ending was a bit of a downer for a film like this, but I'm glad they stuck to their guns and had them all crushed by this human melting pie a few seconds later. Do you think it's over? Yeah, sure. Wrong to the end, but why change the habit of a film time? Okay, there is one massive change I'd make to this. Well, two actually. One, I'd go for the ending where Martin Short dies, and two, I'd have the clown woman end up with the Transy Brothers. It'd be less of a weird rape joke and more of a properly happy ending. Until they all melt off screen, that is. Anyway, this is a film that raises so many questions that are answered by its title. It's a blast, you know it's a blast, you don't need me to tell you it's a blast, it's clearly a blast. Not to say it's perfect though, the brothers are legit annoying and I could have done with more John Vernon. But I'm looking forward to seeing the sequel that'll never be finished that's been promised for literally decades. I'm Neiman Hagen and blah 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 blah. Well, what? I enjoy sitting here, listening to people, taking notes in my suit. It's not like I'm a psychiatrist or anything. Uh, 500 pounds, please. 500? Oh, yeah! Sure! Sure! I'll give you 500 pounds! <laughs>